I never expected to become an OnlyFans creator. Not in a million years. Being raised in a very conservative household where the fear of God has been instilled in me from a very early age, it was impossible to imagine breaking away from everything I knew and had been taught to uphold. It was only when my mom and I ran away from the farm compound we lived in with our family and started interacting with other people who weren't raised the same way that I realized that I had been in a cult. My mom missed my brothers and dad too much and went back after a while, but I didn't. It took many years for me to unlearn all those crazy nonsense things that they fed us, all while learning about the world and how I could fit into it. It was a future I could have never predicted or expected as a child, when my whole life centered around an unrealistic expectation of a lunatic with severe delusions of grandeur that led vulnerable people into a hopeless situation. Neither did I expect, once I made the jump to OnlyFans, that my account would blow up the way it did. Amidst the pandemic, I lost my job and was left completely hopeless and unsure about how I was supposed to pay many bills. One day as I was mindlessly scrolling through Facebook, I saw a post from an old acquaintance with some risque photos and a link to see more of her. And that led me down the rabbit hole of research and I ended up watching every single OnlyFans advice video I could find online to understand how things worked and if it was really something I could bring myself to do. The first few weeks were very rough. To try to ease myself into it, I started as a no-face creator and stayed that way for about two months, until the day I mentioned, while chatting with my audience, that I had recently gotten into anime and someone suggested that I do cosplay content. And that was an absolute game changer. I found my niche and became a top 1% creator within four months. With all the production involved in cosplay, wigs, colored contacts, character acting, and elaborate outfits, I was virtually unrecognizable once fully made up. I felt like I had the best of both worlds. That was three years ago, and although my popularity has had its ups and downs, I still had a large audience of loyal fans who never let me down. Yes, there were eventual creeps with stalker tendencies here and there, but they always gave up, eventually. But that was until I started receiving some unnerving packages in the mail. I had a P.O. box set up in my year one of my OnlyFans journey because some audience members wanted to send me some specific cosplays to wear in photo shoots or live chats, and it sounded like a win-win. The creepy packages started with what I would describe as a fairly average stalker mail, mangled and torn up photos of me from a cosplay photo bundle I'd done a few weeks prior. No note or anything else inside. The next package was slightly more concerning with my photos intact but threatening messages written on the back along the lines of die and you are disgusting. The next package also came with photos, but ones taken of me just out and about, running errands. And that one really freaked me out, because it meant whoever was doing this knew who I was and where I lived. One day, I came home from the gym to find an unmarked box at my front door. I called 911 and explained to the dispatcher what had been happening and that I was afraid to open the package since no one was supposed to know my address. I redirected all my mail to the P.O. box, including my personal ones. On top of that, my house was kind of secluded. My closest neighbor ran a hunting lodge and only ever saw him on the off chance when he was in the woods that we shared, setting up traps big enough to catch a bear. She told me that unless I had a reason to believe that there was a bomb inside the box, there was nothing she could do preemptively. I would have to open up the box and find out. So I did. The contents were more or less the same as the other packages. Some photos and some insults that could be interpreted as vague threats, but nothing direct or immediate. Just like all the previous ones, that too was signed with XOXO, mimicking the way I always say goodbye to fans after ending my live chats. 
The dispatcher instructed me to file a report with the police if the packages continued to show up at my door and to install some cameras around the property and an alarm if I didn't already have one. I followed her advice and installed a ring camera since I already had an alarm. Things were quiet after that and I assumed that the obsessed fan had simply moved on to someone else. Two months went by without another scary experience and I let my guard down. Big mistake. I was doing one of my special events, a whole month of requested cosplays, that time being one piece, when I thought I heard a knock at the front door downstairs. I asked my audience if they heard anything, but they all said no. A few minutes later, I heard the knock again, and that time, I was sure of it. It was loud enough that even people in the chat could hear it. When the knocks were followed by the frantic buzz of the doorbell, I checked my Ring camera app to see who it was. To my surprise, I found the screen fully black. I didn't know if someone had managed to disable it without me realizing it or if it had been covered somehow. Either way, there was someone lurking outside my house in the middle of the night. I was about to end the live chat to call the police when the power went out. Just like that, I was left in total darkness. Barricading myself inside the room, I dialed 911 and went on a full rant as soon as the operator answered the call. Please, you have to help me. Someone is lurking outside my house trying to break in. The power went out. I think they cut it. So I locked myself in my bedroom just in case. Okay, ma'am, do you have a security system installed? I do, but uh, the power went out. Uh, will it still work? It depends on the system, ma'am. Do you see what the intruder looked like? No. Uh, when I checked my phone, my ring camera was black. I, uh, I think they covered it with something. Please hurry. My phone had little to no service when I called, so I don't think they could pinpoint my exact location, and instead had to rely on my poor direction-giving skills. Just in case, I stayed on the phone with the dispatcher. Everything was so quiet after that. All I could hear was my own heavy breathing. Are they anywhere nearby already? The officers are about 20 minutes away from your location that you provided. At that time, 20 minutes seemed like 20 hours. My eyes were glued to the door, looking for any slight movement or for a shadow to cross through the threshold. Anything that you can indicate the presence of someone else. My worst fears came true when I saw the door handle turning ever so slowly. He's inside the house, I whispered to the operator. He's trying to get to my bedroom. The handle started to shake violently as the person tried to get in. After that, it was silent again until I heard the deafening noise of a gunshot that shattered the metal piece. The heavy dresser against the door wouldn't stop him for long. My only chance was getting out of the bedroom through the window. I crawled across the roof until I reached one of the trellis bolted to the walls and climbed down. When I looked up, I saw a masked man staring at me through my open window. It would take him some time to go downstairs and into the front yard so I still had a chance to run towards the woods. As soon as I turned around, I felt a piercing pain on my side, followed by a warm gush running down my stomach. With blurry eyes, I saw another masked man standing right in front of me, the blade of his knife dripping with blood. My blood. Somehow he seemed surprised, almost as if he didn't intend to stab me. I fell to my knees just as the other man joined us, and they both just stood there, staring at me. Why? Then, the one with the knife lunged at me, all his weight to pin me to the ground. Up close, I could see he had big blue eyes that were very similar to mine. Too similar. It, it couldn't be. Michael? The blue eyes widened desperately, and he looked back at the other one as if asking for guidance. That was all the confirmation I needed. 
I had seen the same motion countless of times before. I was staring at Michael, my younger brother, which meant that the other man was most likely my older brother, Joshua. It seemed that being recognized wasn't part of that plan because Michael was clearly taken aback, panicking, and I knew his weak point. He had been born with a malformation in one of his legs, making it much shorter than the other. If I could get away from under him and run, he wouldn't be able to follow, and then I could worry about the biggest threat, Joshua and the gun. All I had to do was distract him for a while longer. Michael, please don't hurt me, I pleaded, reaching out to touch his face under the balaclava. He wavered, and I took my chance, jamming my fingers <clears throat> into his eyes. As soon as he stumbled back, I pushed the rest of him off of me all the way, and he fell on top of Joshua, both of them falling to the ground, and then I ran towards the woods. I didn't know if I would make it to the neighbor's lodge, but I knew he was a hunter, and I knew he wouldn't hesitate to shoot whoever was necessary. If I got close enough, all I had to do was scream for help. I ran until the soles of my feet were raw from scraping against loose twigs and gritty rocks. I was bleeding, completely terrified, and beyond exhausted. But I was going to make it. I was going to... A gunshot landed right beside my feet, forcing me to stop. Damn! Do you like my gift, Sophie? I didn't say anything, so he went on. Turn around and answer me. You're a sick ass, Josh, I answered once we were facing each other. Always were, always will be. I'm just ridding the world of another Jezebel. Dad would be proud of me, Mom too. The mention of my mom was too much for me and I felt all the adrenaline leaving my body. I didn't have any strength left. God have mercy on your soul, sinner. I heard him approaching, and I closed my eyes, waiting for the inevitable. The police wouldn't get there in time to save me, and even if my neighbors heard the gunshot, neither would he. I was going to die alone in the middle of the woods, and no one to mourn me. And that was when I heard Josh <laughs> a scream like I'd never heard before or after that. I opened my eyes and saw that he had stepped in one of the big traps set by my neighbor. Risking a closer look, I noticed that both jaws, when closed, were large enough to almost meet in the middle, nearly severing his foot from his ankle. Every time he tried to open the jaws, they would slip from his grip, cutting even deeper than before. I also noticed that in his desperate attempts to free himself, he lost hold of the gun. Walking towards him, I unceremoniously grabbed the gun from the ground. I could either shoot him and end his misery, or I could leave him and wait until he died from blood loss. Instead, I opted for stepping over the semi-closed trap with all my strength effectively severing his foot. Joshua cursed and screamed, coiling on the ground like a wounded snake. The blood was slowly gathering around him. It looked almost black in the moonlight. Distantly, I heard the sound of police sirens approaching as the red and blue lights lit the surroundings in brief intervals. Too little too late, I thought, checking the gun to see how many rounds it still had. Either way, I only needed one. I still had Michael to take care of. I watched them through the trees. The blonde girl looks frustrated. We haven't come across any lost hikers in months. They're more common than you'd think. I can't believe you didn't bring a map, just in case. You were assigned to navigate, so I figured you would bring one too, you know, navigate. 
The sun dyed the clouds a dark orange and rich pink as it dipped below the trees. I stood there for hours, watching them go in circles. They must have walked by me five times before they realized they were lost. Father sent me out to see if anyone was lost. We had not come across anyone for months. The lady instructed the man to start setting up their camp. She was going to explore the area to see if she could find a water source and pick up some firewood. The man set up his blue tent with ease. He wasn't smart enough to bring a map, but he had experience doing this. I've watched many people set up tents, but I don't think anyone did it as fast as him. I stepped closer to see what else they brought to camp. They had instant mashed potatoes, beef jerky, dried fruit, nuts and protein bars. There was more, but that's all I could see peeking out of an orange backpack. I stepped close, and a twig snapped. I gasped. The man's head shot in my direction, and our eyes met. We both stood stunned, looking at each other for what felt like five minutes. It's not usually how I go about luring people back to father, so I was at a loss of what to do next. Fortunately, right as it looked like he would approach me, the lady returned. You see her too, right? The man asked. She nodded her head and slowly started to approach me like I was a rabid animal. She kneeled to be at my eye level. Her eyes were green with brown and gold flakes. Hi, miss. I'm Lucy. Do you have a name? I didn't respond or make any movement. Any chance your mom or dad are nearby? This was my chance. I nodded my head. You must be our guardian angel, she said with a big smile. Before she could ask anything else, I took off towards the cabin. I tried to pace myself. I've lost hikers before because I weave through the trees too fast for them to keep up. Having to backtrack to find them is annoying, and the delay angers father. I checked behind me occasionally to ensure they were keeping up. Soon enough, we ran into the meadow where I live. Father was doing laundry, so our clothes, which faded into a light brown over time, were hanging out to dry. Some of them had speckled red stains. I yelled for father. I heard the man behind me. Did you ever see The Hills Have Eyes or Red Deliverance by James Dickey? He was out of breath from following me. No, why? They're about backwoods cannibals. I didn't know what a cannibal was. Lucy snorted a little. Are they works of fiction? Yeah, but let's just be careful, he said. Father emerged from the cabin. He was wearing his kitchen apron and his hands looked freshly washed. I point to the hikers, he smiled at me and gave me a wink. He walked up to them and introduced himself. I'm Edward. Welcome to our little corner of Appalachia. Lucy was relieved and introduced herself and her friend who was named Joey. She explained how they got lost and realized they didn't have a map. She wondered if he could point them in the right direction of civilization. Huh. I've seen a lost hiker a time or two but it's usually because they can't read their map. But yes, about a day's hike in that direction and you'll be in Chesterton. He pointed to his left. Quaint little town, but they'll get you the help you need. Lucy turned to look at Joey and gave him a reassuring smile. Father continued, Since the sun is setting and you'll have to camp for the night, is there any chance you might want to join us for dinner? It's so rare we get visitors way out here. That sounds much better than the instant mashed potatoes we have. Lucy said. Father was pleased, so he squeezed my shoulder. Sweetie, can you get our guests some water? He invited them inside and began to show them around. I ran to the kitchen to get the glasses and the special dust Father instructed me to mix in. He was always very specific that I needed to wait until the dust was completely dissolved before giving it to the guests, so I sat and watched. Once the water was crystal clear, I ran out to the front room to give the glasses to Lucy and Joey. They thanked me. Father was telling them about how he decided the big city wasn't for us. He was disgusted by how most people got on with their lives in heavily populated areas. Even churches couldn't get it right. He wanted to raise me in solitude so the world wouldn't sully me. Lucy gulped the water down, but Joey slowly sipped his. Father explained how excited he was to teach me the Bible correctly when he noticed Joey taking his time with the water. Dehydration is no joke, boy. He encouraged him to drink more. Joey nodded but didn't start drinking the water faster like father wanted. Lucy began to nod off. She looked at her friend confused by the sudden drowsiness and he shook his head at her. She fell asleep on the couch. Father looked at Joey. 
Well, this won't do. Before Joey could react, Father grabbed his head and pounded it against the corner of the coffee table. Father turned to me and said, Sweetie, how about you play outside until dinner is ready? Oh, but can you bring the clothes in and fold them? Just stay out of the kitchen. I nodded my head and skipped out. I yanked the clothes off the wire. I ran them inside and folded them in Father's bedroom. Then I slept on the couch in the front room. I could hear Father talking to Lucy in the kitchen. I wondered where Joey went. Maybe he went back to camp because he seemed nervous being here. Joey? I heard Lucy say. Her voice was much fainter than when she introduced herself earlier. Joey's a little salty for my taste, Father said. What's your diet like? He must have been about that fast food junk. Don't worry, I'll make sure it's painless like I did for him. I don't enjoy this. It's just so hard to catch good protein out here. I've got a growing girl to feed. I finished the clothes and ran back outside to busy myself. Father made a stew for dinner. He explained that Lucy and Joey weren't feeling great, so they returned to their camp. My mouth watered. It smelled delicious. I picked up my spoon, but Father snapped at me. We haven't said grace. Put your spoon down. He watched me set it down and folded my hands to pray. Can you say grace, sweetie? I nodded. Dear Lord, thank you for the food we are about to eat. Please bless it to our bodies. Thank you for Father and Lucy and Joey. May we meet more hikers soon. In his name, amen. I was never big into babysitting. From time to time, I could pick up a job to help a friend, or if one of my mom's friends couldn't find a sitter. As the youngest in my family, I never experienced caring for those younger than me, so babysitting always felt outside my scope of capabilities. I have a hard time knowing how to control kids. It's just, I never learned how to punish or handle kids appropriately. Not that I was doing or wanting anything inappropriate, but I always feared I'd do something wrong, and the parent would come home outraged that I put their kid in their room for 20 minutes. Like, what do you do when two thin boys pull their pants down and start peeing on each other in the middle of the living room, spraying all the expensive suede furniture? Better babysitters have an answer. I, on the other hand, stood in horror, shielding my eyes as I begged them to stop. They didn't, and I didn't take another babysitting job until my mom told me about this couple at their church that was desperate for a sitter. They offered me $150 for a night, which was astronomical back in the day. I didn't even think to ask why they were desperate. The kid's mom made it sound like an easy gig. One kid, 10 years old, get there at 5.30 p.m. and his bedtime was 8.30 p.m. and she said they would get back around 11 to midnight. Three hours watching TV with a kid for $150? Absolutely, sign me up. They lived in a baby blue two-story home with white wood details on the windows. I knocked on the white door, and the boy's mom opened the door wearing a flattering maroon wrapped dress. She was beautiful. My mom mentioned how stunning and young she looked for her age. Frankly, my mom didn't do this woman justice. She could have been a supermodel with her long auburn hair and mahogany eyes. Her name was Trish, and she insisted I call her by her first name. She invited me in. Trish had flawlessly decorated her home. It was the perfect balance of cozy with plush carpets and taste with sleek leather furniture. Thank you so much for doing this. You have no idea how hard it can be to find a sitter, she told me. She turned to yell up the stairs. Charles, come meet your sitter, Lexi. A young boy descended the stairs. The energy of the room grew grim with each step he took. He got his hair and eye color from his mother. His hair was perfectly parted on the side like he was a little man going to work at a bank. Charles' choice of clothing contributed to his small man persona. He wore an argyle sweater vest over a white button-up with trousers. Charles did not strike me as a typical ten-year-old. Charles, this is Lexi. He looked up at me with a straight face. His mom continued. Say hi, Charles, please. Charles ignored his mother's pleas and nodded at me. Hi Charles, I'm Lexi. Is it cool if I hang out with you tonight? I wanted it to seem like I knew what I was doing for his mom's sake, but it didn't seem Charles registered what I said. Please Charles, Trish urged her son. He maintained his stoic aura. 
Trisha's husband came around the corner holding a tiny tuxedo kitten. The kitten looked to be about five to six months old. He had white mittens and a white tip on his tail. When her husband eyed Charles standing in the foyer with us, he hesitated before coming closer. Trish nodded at him to encourage him to join us. He was equally as handsome as his wife. He wore glasses and dressed the same as his son. Oh yes, can you also feed Mr. Tingles? Trish asked. I love cats, so I was ecstatic to hang out with the kitten after the boy went to bed. Charles seemed indifferent towards the cat, rolling his eyes at his mother's evident excitement over Mr. Tingles. Before Trish left, she told me to call her if there were any issues, any at all. She would have her phone on her the entire time. After his parents left, Charles didn't speak. He stared at me the entire time. I tried to talk to him, but Charles wouldn't respond. He would just sit there like a ventriloquist dummy with a frown. I thought he might be excited about Mr. Tingles, but his frown grew more profound when I asked him about the cat. Complaining about a quiet kid feels weird, but something about Charles made my skin crawl. We sat down to eat our Kraft mac and cheese. Lexi? He broke the silence. Yes? If I put enough pressure, could I pierce your hand with my fork? Um, yeah, probably. Why? Charles shrugged and stabbed his mac and cheese to pick it up while keeping eye contact with me. What the hell? After dinner, I asked if he wanted to watch a movie. He didn't say anything, so I put one on because I was getting weirded out by the silence. We sat and watched a TV show his mom mentioned he liked. I tried to make time move faster until the kid needed to go to bed. His bedtime finally rolled around, and without saying anything, he got up from his spot on the couch and went up to the stairs to get ready for bed, taking the kitten with him. I told him I would clean up dinner and meet him up there to say goodnight. Of course, he wouldn't respond. As expected, he made no noise as he got ready for bed. He cleaned up the kitchen and went upstairs to check on him. He wasn't in the bedroom, so I walked around to his room, and he was lying on his stomach, reading a book in bed on his pillow. His elbows were propped up on the pillow, holding it down. Hey Charles, just checking to see how you're doing, or if you need anything? No response. Okay, cool. Before I turned to go back downstairs to leave the boy to his book, I realized I didn't see Mr. Tingles. Charles, where's Mr. Tingles? Does he sleep with you? I asked, hoping he would say no so I could cuddle with him after Charles went to bed. He didn't say anything and continued to read his book. As I turned around to walk away, I heard a weak and muffled meow. I turned to Charles and saw a small white-tipped tail whipping around from under the pillow, but I couldn't see Mr. Tingle's head. Charles, where's Mr. Tingle's? No response. Charles, please answer me. Where is Mr. Tingle's? He ignored me and continued to read. I could see the cat's tail peeking out from under the pillow, so I knew he had the cat fully under the pillow. Did he know that would suffocate the cat? I think he's under your pillow. You need to let him go, he can't breathe. No, he finally spoke. Charles, no, no, no. He started throwing a tantrum as I pleaded for him to release the cat. Mr. Tingles would suffocate, so with time running out and no other choice, I ran and picked Charles up to release the cat. Mr. Tingles bolted out of the room once he was released from Charles. I couldn't believe what had just taken place. Charles knew what he was doing and he wanted to kill Mr. Tingles. I wasn't sure how to react, so I made him go to bed then and there and locked him in his room. When his parents arrived home, I explained what happened and Trish burst into tears. Apparently, he killed their last cat, the cat Trish had for 13 years by putting it in the dryer. Trish recently got Mr. Tingles, hoping it was a one-time thing. Then, I understood why they had difficulty finding and keeping a sitter. I didn't babysit for them or anyone else again. My name is Derek, and I'm a freelance writer. I don't make a lot of money, but I make enough to get by. I have a few steady clients that I work for, but I'm always looking out for more gigs. Recently, I had some minor surgery, and I needed money fast. 
I looked everywhere, but I couldn't find anything. Then someone recommended that I check out the writing gigs that are posted on Craigslist. I'd never used Craigslist before because I figured that a lot of the postings on there are a little sketchy, but I was desperate. Right away, I found a post for a writing assistant that paid really good money. I emailed the client that I was interested, and he said that the job had to be done in person at his house. Normally, I would have said no, but I ended up agreeing. After all, it was a lot of money for some easy work. The client's name was Robert, and he lived pretty close to my house. I drove over to his place, making sure that I had pepper spray in my pocket just in case. His house was a lot nicer than mine. He greeted me at the door, and seemed like a normal person. He gave me a quick tour of the house, and then he led me to a work table covered in sealed envelopes. He handed me a list of names and said that all I had to do was write down the names on the envelopes. That was it. No addresses, just names. I tried to ask him what was inside the envelopes, but he smiled and said, eh, don't worry about it. So for the next few hours, I sat at the table and copied a different name onto each envelope. I didn't see Robert the entire time. Aside from getting some cramps in my hand, it was the easiest job I'd ever done. By the time Robert came back, it was already night. I was so focused on the work that I hadn't noticed the time. He thanked me for working so hard, and asked if I wanted to crash in his guest bedroom for the night. I thanked him, but I really just wanted to go home. He gave me an envelope filled with cash including an extra $300 for my, and I'm quoting here, terrific penmanship. I went back home and didn't really think about it after that. I had all the money I needed to cover my bills. Then, a few days later, I was scrolling through the local news when I saw an article about a group of women who'd gone missing in my area. All the names seemed familiar. It took me a second to realize that they were all on Robert's list. I considered calling the police, but I decided against it. After all, it could have been just a coincidence. And if the letters were somehow connected to the disappearances, I didn't want to implicate myself. I decided to just let it go. But over the next few days, I started looking for reports of more disappearances. And there were a bunch. And all the missing persons had names I remembered. I knew it wasn't just a coincidence. The next weekend, Robert emailed me again, asking if I wanted to come back and do more work for him. I know I should have refused, but I was just too curious. So I accepted. And later that day, I was back at his house, working on another pile of envelopes. Once again, Robert left the room as soon as I started working. This time, I secretly took a photo of the new name list on my phone, and I pocketed one of the letters without writing any name on it. I didn't want to open the envelope while I was there in case he had security cameras watching me or something. When I was finished, Robert came back, paid me, and I left. When I got home, I checked to make sure that I was alone, and I opened the envelope. There was a single note card inside but all it had was a happy face drawn in black marker. This whole thing was getting stranger and stranger. Still curious, I drove to the police station and showed them the list of names that I'd saved on my phone. I told them everything that had happened so far and explained that if any of these people are reported missing, then they need to go to Robert's house. The guy looked at me like I was insane, but he saved the list, and he said he'd let me know if anything happened. I went back home and tried to forget about it. I did what I could. I still had that blank envelope and note card sitting on my counter. Less than three hours later, I got a call from the officer saying that two of the people on the list had already been reported missing. One from his own backyard, and the other on the way home from school. I started to freak out, but he assured me that they'd figure out what was going on. He'd already sent someone to Robert's house. That night, I couldn't sleep. I was confused and scared, and I couldn't stop thinking about that stupid, happy face on the note card. What 
did it mean? By two in the morning, I heard footsteps from somewhere inside my house. Had Robert come for me? I reached for my phone on the end table, but it wasn't there. I realized that I'd left it charging in the living room. I couldn't call for help, and I didn't have a way out of my room. I was trapped. So I very quietly got out of bed and walked to my bedroom door. I locked it, and then very slowly dragged my dresser in front of the door. I crouched down and waited. I could still hear the footsteps outside. They were louder now, probably from my hallway. Whoever was inside my house was walking right to me. I waited for the longest time, barely able to breathe, until the footsteps stopped outside my door. Everything was silent for a while, and then the intruder started slowly scratching on the other side of the door. He knew that I was here. He was taunting me. Go away! I screamed. The scratching got louder, more insistent. Then the whole door shook. The intruder slammed against it. I backed away and watched as an axe slammed through the door. Then it slammed again. He was cutting his way into my room. The hole in the door got big enough for me to see through it. The man on the other side was wearing a blank white mask with a happy face drawn in marker, just like the note card. He was huge, too, well over six feet tall. Robert was much shorter, so it couldn't be him. Stop! I screamed. The man in the mask looked at me through the hole in the door. He cocked his head to the side, like he was studying me. God, I never should have taken that envelope. Then he reached through the hole and started pushing my dresser out of the way. I couldn't believe how strong he was. I knew that if he made his way inside my bedroom, there was no way I'd be able to fight him off. With one big swipe, he pushed the massive dresser onto its side. Then, he grabbed the door handle and twisted off the lock. Pushed the door open. By then, I was cowering against the wall, too scared to move. He walked into my room, his axe hanging from one hand. Who are you? I whimpered. What do you want? Then police sirens blared through the air. The masked man froze. Then, he dropped the axe, turned around, and left as if nothing had happened. I was in a complete state of shock when the policeman came inside. The officer I'd talked to earlier said that my neighbor had reported a break-in at my address. He recognized me from earlier, so he knew that this was serious. I asked him if he saw the man with the happy face mask, but he shook his head. The man had left before they arrived. I asked if they had gotten any information out of Robert, but he said that Robert's house was empty when they visited him. I walked with the police back into my living room. I wanted to show them the happy face card, but it was gone. They had a deputy wait outside my house for the rest of the night in case the attacker came back. He didn't. It's been three days now, and I don't know if I'm safe or if that man will come back for me. I still don't understand what happened. The only thing I know for certain is that I never should have taken that envelope. Happiness often came cheap, but it was never free. When my friends came together after long months of being away overseas, just as I had been for work, we gathered and drank to be merry. For what it cost a few dollars, those nights were mostly the best of the year for all three of us, Luca, Jason, and I. We always drank strong, and perhaps, if I had been more attentive to the fact that Jason never drank the entire night, this story might have had a different end. I had asked twice, in the usual way that we caught up with each other, a nudge to the shoulder and a flick of the head, if Jason was okay. He smiled at me and nodded. I didn't think much of it. It had been months since we had caught up, and we had the days ahead of us for up to a week to discuss whatever it was that was troubling him. I asked for booze and there was much for us to drink. It wasn't long before I was absolutely hammered drunk. Luca was also drunk and I could tell because in my inebriation, 
I could see him singing at the top of his voice, loud in the bar. I thought it was funny, so I laughed about it. Jason simpered. I saw, but it was one of those brief ones that were gone before one could acknowledge it in such a state as I was. You know you can't drive home like this, Jason queried me, and I protested him, feigning sobriety, but he dismissed me with the wave of his hand. I was in no shape to drive, he maintained. You'd have to sleep over at my house, and by morning, we'll come get your car. I said my thank you, and the rest of the night at the bar went by in a dreamy blur. I didn't remember the drive, but I recalled Jason heaving me up the flight of stairs to his apartment, and how he helped me maintain my balance by placing his hands over my shoulders so I never plastered my face against the wall in the wobbling. I had also been too drunk to rein in my thoughts when I asked him why he had such a grave countenance all evening. He said it was nothing at first, perhaps assuming I was too drunk to understand him. But when I too maintained some sense of focus despite how desperately I cling to clarity, he told me about a small problem. Jason said he felt as though he were being followed by someone. I was perplexed. Do you owe anybody some money? I asked, tumbling into the couch. He said he didn't and he had no idea how he must have attracted attention from a stalker. I drifted into a plane of unconsciousness when he started to narrate the detail further and only heard him say this person was a short, burly man. Spoken to the police? I asked when I sensed he had stopped talking. He said he hadn't because he wasn't sure yet. A bilious ball of lukewarm puke slimed up my throat and I felt the urge to use the bathroom quickly. I spun around and rushed to the bathroom. With my head over the bowl, I turned numb. I can't recall how long I was in that position with the door shut, but when I finally awoke from my slumber, my neck hurt. The smell of my vomit all over the toilet seat wafted into my nostrils, and it made my tongue dry. Damn, I muttered, registering where I was. My bones creaked when I tried to move, and I could not bring myself to flush the toilet. I yowled quietly and dragged myself to my feet with all of the strength I could manage. I sauntered from the bathroom into the bedroom, which was in such a state of dishevelment, it made me recoil in shock. I cussed a few times, thinking to myself that I must have caused the hell in the room and how much it would cost me to fix it for Jason. The wardrobe was slightly open and I saw the specter of a figure crouched over beside it. I suspected it was Jason trying to play a trick on me and I refused him the satisfaction of me getting rattled. I staggered to the living room and there he was, Jason lying on the table with a huge knife pinning his solar plexus into the table. I retched when I noticed his ginger hair scraped from his scalp, leaving a bloodless network of tissue around his head. My stomach sank. It was a nightmare, I hoped. I held my hand up and pinched my skin, but it hurt. I almost groaned in pain before it struck me that someone else was in the house. My instinct pricked me to escape, but I was rooted to the floor. I knew there was one more of you gingers in this house, and I saw you come in too. The absolute monster of a man with yellow eyes stormed out from his hiding place. I had no time to express my confusion, when he at once drew out the same type of knife he had killed Jason with. What? H who are you? I whimpered, falling backwards, all the cogs in my head spinning out of the machinery. This is Christmas to me. Two ginger heads in one night? I'll be a rich man, he smiled and started to stalk me around the living room. I quivered from sheer terror, limbs and arms swinging around as dread crept up my spine. I couldn't tell if it was the horror that made me so clear-headed, but I was drenched in so much panic in that moment that nothing mattered but my survival. Don't duck me, I'll give you mercy kill, his crazed mouth revealed. I just need the head and I'll be a rich man. <laughs> his clarity despite his madness made me consider if running away from such a dangerous beast was worth it. But I had seen what he had done to Jason. I could not imagine myself killed with such a savage intent because a madman thought the head of gingers in some strange ritual would make him into a rich man. Jason. My friend's name rang in my head and made me so angry that the man who had killed him still haunted me. Throw that knife and in this! I hollered at him, trying to be calm in defiance of the utter dread that ravaged my entire being. For some reason, crazy as this monster was, 
he aimed his knife at me and swung. The blade cut right past my ear, missing me by a few centimeters. I was beside myself with rage when the blade banged on the wall and fell onto the floor. He lunged at me, coming after the knife. I went down to the floor and grabbed it first, running it straight into his chest before it could land on his feet. He growled, and I pushed the blade deeper and wider across his flesh until he meowed, fainting to the floor. I touched nothing else in the room but my phone, and I called the emergency number. An ambulance came up in a but they were both dead. It was not until Jason and the monster had been taken away that I realized the full extent of what had just happened. The cops told me I had just killed a maniac who was on a murdering spree of redheads, murdering five people as far as they could count. My wife Gretchen and I had been having problems for a long time. We'd been together since high school, and I think we were just growing apart. For the last few years, I could tell that Gretchen was pulling away. She'd find excuses to leave the house, and then lie to me about where she was. After a while, I figured out that she was having an affair. I knew I should have confronted her about it, but I didn't have the courage. Instead, I did something truly awful. I got on a dating app and decided to find someone myself. It didn't take long before I matched with a beautiful blonde woman named Nikki. We chatted for a bit, and I was very open about everything. She knew that I was married and didn't want anything besides a hookup. She was fine with that. We arranged to meet for the first time at a hotel just outside the city. It wasn't in a nice area, but I figured that I wouldn't run into anyone who knew me. I told Gretchen that I had a work conference to go to. I got to the hotel just around sunset. I checked into the room and texted Nikki. She didn't respond. I waited in the room, took a shower, waited some more, and Nikki never came. Eventually, I got a single message from her. Changed my mind. Sorry. She wasn't coming. I was going to be here alone. I guess it was my own fault. I should never have done this in the first place. I was a married man, and maybe this was fate telling me not to betray my wife. I thought about going home and telling Gretchen that the conference had been cancelled, but I knew that was a bad idea. She'd have too many questions. So instead, I just curled up in bed and started watching the hotel TV. I was feeling pretty sorry for myself, and after a while, I needed to get out of that room. It was just so depressing. So I put on my shorts and went down to the hotel's pool. When I got there, I noticed a woman sitting in the jacuzzi by herself. She was blonde. And for a second, I thought that it was Nikki. But when she turned to look at me, I realized that it was just some stranger. She smiled at me, and I smiled back. I joined her in the jacuzzi, and right away, we hit it off. Like me, she was staying there alone. She didn't tell me why she was there, which was fine by me, because I didn't want to explain myself either. We chatted for a bit, and then she asked me if I wanted some company in my room. At first, I thought that my wishes had come true. Nikki never showed up, but I would found someone else instead. It was perfect. Then I started having some doubts. Maybe she was a hooker. I know it sounds hypocritical since I'd come here to cheat on my wife, but I wasn't interested in paying for sex. That was too much. Still, she was very beautiful. I didn't want to ask her point blank, so I casually asked what she did for a living. I'm a waitress. She explained. That was good enough for me. I invited her up to my room right away. We got out of the jacuzzi and walked up to the second floor. Her room was a few doors down from mine, and she had to run inside and change. I told her my room number and said I'd wait for her there. Very excitedly, I ran into my room, changed out of my wet shorts, and waited for her to knock. I waited 10 minutes and she never showed up, then 20 started to think that maybe she'd change her mind. I should have just gone to bed, but I couldn't stop thinking about this woman. I didn't even know her name, but she was so beautiful and so close. I grabbed my room key and walked over to the room where she was staying. The curtains were closed, but I could see that the light was still on inside. I knocked, but she didn't answer. I could hear movements on the other side, though. I knew she was there. 
I turned to go back to my room, but something told me to stop. I had a strange feeling that something wasn't right. I looked around to make sure that no one else was looking. Then I leaned closer to the window and tried to look inside through the gap in the curtain. I saw the blonde woman lying on her bed. She was flailing around, covered in blood. Someone was standing over her, driving a knife into her stomach. I couldn't see the attacker clearly, but it looked like another woman. I was witnessing a murder. I had to stop it. I pounded the door, screaming. What are you doing? Then the door slowly creaked open and I couldn't believe who was standing on the other side. It was Gretchen, my wife. You should have stayed in your room, she said. I started to ask her what was going on, but she grabbed me before I could say anything. She would pulled me into the hotel room and I closed the door behind me. I almost threw up. The other woman was lying dead on the mattress. Blood was everywhere. What did you do? I asked. I killed her, she said, just like I killed your other friend, Nikki. Why? Because I love you, she said, very much. When she pulled back, I could finally see just how crazy she looked. We'd been married for a decade and I barely recognized her like this. I know what you're going to say, Gretchen said, and I forgive you. I know you'll never do anything like this again. We have to call the police, I told her. She laughed as if I'd said the dumbest thing in the world. You wouldn't do that. I'm your wife. Then she backed up, sitting down on the bed. The dead body was right behind her. She patted the blood-soaked mattress, trying to get me to sit with her. Come here, she said. I'm in the mood. I had never felt so disgusted in my life. I couldn't even process what was happening. It was just too much. When I didn't say anything, Gretchen pulled the knife out of the woman's stomach and then pointed it at me. Hurry up, she said. I need to get some condoms from the other room. I told her. I'll be right back. Good thinking, she said. I ran out of there, but instead of going to my room, I went to the lobby and called the police. This all happened three months ago. Since then, Gretchen has been taken into custody, where she admitted to several other murders. I guess she hadn't been cheating on me at all. She'd been leaving the house to kill. I've known my wife since we were both 15. I had no idea she had this kind of darkness in her. Nothing prepared me for how dreary traveling across three states in the scorching heat of day could be. Not the bottles of water in my car or the music blasting through my radio was enough company for hours upon endless hours of road that ran through forests and deserts. Not the muse I had and mirages that formed in the road ahead and disappeared into nothingness when approached. The need for human interaction superseded all else, and I regretted the lockdown that came with the pandemic. This pandemic disease that had started as a simple matter on the news had taken over the world. They said it was a virus with a high mortality rate and could be transmitted just as easily as it ravaged the body. Flights were canceled and trains were put out of service until they figured it out. And perhaps in my mind, this was the worst of all of the effects of the pandemic. The fact that it was absolutely horrifying did not affect the mind as much as it modified human relationships in a matter of months. I suspected I would be at home with my computer, watching the news and waiting out the mess, if it were not for the absolute necessity of my dying father whom I had to go see. Mother had warned me to be safe, but I could not allow it, knowing I could help see my father again before he was no more. So I drove on the deserted highway with my music turned high and my mind wholly secured on reaching him. I suspect that the road was not always as empty as it was now because it had an eerie vacancy in the distance without the distraction of other cars coming and going. The effect of such loneliness was so immense that when I finally came around to finding a gas station, <laughs> I almost leaped out of my car for joy. 
I had most of the things I needed in my car, gas and food, but the pleasure of human interaction which I had missed for long hours made me pull over. All I needed to do, I said to myself, was get something and strike a conversation for no more than five minutes and I would be on my way, refreshed. The gas pumps clicked and hummed when I pulled my vehicle in, but there was still that vacant feeling in the atmosphere as there were no cars around to fetch gas. The business place was open, and it quickly took my mind away from that dreary feeling. I stopped at the third pump for no other reason than the fact that it felt right. I debated bringing my licensed pistol with me to the pump, but I decided against it because there didn't seem to be a present threat. The possibility that I could pose a threat with a gun on me helped my decision. So I made my saunter to the counter with a few dollars in my pocket and the rest of my effect on the car seat. Hello! A bald-headed man with a chipped tooth wearing an apron saluted from behind the counter. His hand dropped to his side, but his smile remained. Eh, it's been a while since anyone's driven past these parts. I grinned and asked him if he had not heard of the pandemic. He wheezed in laughter, throwing his hand in the air. He claimed it was all just government propaganda to control the masses. He was doing just well for himself, he said, away from all the garbage of society. I snickered. It was not a conversation that I was willing to pursue, and he perceived it. I gave him my money and asked for gas on pump three. Where are you going from here? He asked as he worked his way around his device to discharge gas to me. I thought it was a strange question and I blanched. I had the better sense to tell him my travel was none of his business, as his strangeness had begun to make me uneasy. I'm going to see my father, I answered instead. He nodded. He said he had a father once, but the man had been a bother. Too much of a bother that he could take none of it. I said my father was no bother. I would not understand, he said. He had a peculiar situation with his father. I looked around and asked him if he ran the gas station with his father. I used to, he replied. I feigned concern, realizing he may have suffered some tragedy. Then he turned vicious. I snapped that guy. Too many complaints and too much of a fuss. I whimpered, as though I hadn't heard him correctly. He paused, realizing he had said too much. I saw the patch of his bald head all the way to his face drain white and bloodless as he went over the circumstance in his head. Does anybody know about this? I asked, and regretted asking. A few people, he said carefully. Not any like you. I keep them. The tip of my lips twitched and I felt a sudden chill run up my spine. In his eyes, the truth lay potent and forceful. I knew he wasn't lying. The environment and the loneliness lent him credence. This was a man capable of taking me out, confessing his serial murders to me as though it were no mean feat. My stomach rejected the thought with a quarrelsome grumble. He heard it and sniffed my dread. Droplets of sweat from the side of my face started to poke out from my pores. Gas and pump three, please. I said, and walked towards the door knowing I was yet to escape him. The voices in my head banged, and my eardrums thrummed with the beat of my heart. I closed my hands into a tight fist as I walked slowly to my car. I had walked a few steps from the store when I noticed another footstep had joined me in the march. The sense of dread, knowing he was behind me, almost crippled me. I was so afraid, I, I forcefully inhaled to get air into my lungs. I knew turning around was dangerous, so I did not turn around until I was beside my car. And there he was in the reflective glass, holding a pickaxe above my head. He swung hard, and I ducked out of the way by a hair's breadth. His axe shattered my glass window. In my desperation to survive, I knew I had very limited chances of surviving the deranged gas station owner, chief of which was the pistol I kept in the driver's seat. I knew it. He did not. You can't leave! You can't leave! He bellowed, swinging his axe at me, and it caught me by the shirt. The blade sliced a shallow cut into my flesh. I shoved my hand into the driver's seat where I had kept my pistol and drew it out. 
He bleached when he saw how quickly I wielded my pistol, and my terror was now his. In the final seconds before I pulled my trigger, his eyes turned beastly in rage to consume me. But it was over before he could move as I placed one between his eyes. I was on my way from that strange gas station in a blink, still reeling in the horror of what could have been. I met my girlfriend Rita a few months ago. She was perfect, beautiful, funny, rich. Honestly, she was really out of my league. Everyone said so. In August, she asked me to stay with her at a beachside Airbnb for a few weeks. It was her treat. I said yes, of course. It seemed like a really romantic place. As soon as we got there, I was amazed by the house. It must have cost her a fortune. She just said that it was a little present for being such a good boyfriend. We unpacked and spent the evening on the patio overlooking the water. When we went back inside to cook dinner, I noticed something strange. Even though Rita told me that she'd never been here before, she seemed to know exactly where everything was, and all the foods that were already pre-stocked in the refrigerator were the same brands that she always bought. I wanted to ask her about it, but I didn't want to seem ungrateful so I didn't say anything. She ended up doing all the cooking, and after we ate, she asked if I wanted to go for a walk along the beach. She led the way, and I noticed that she seemed to know exactly where she was going, like there was something she wanted to show me. I was too curious not to say something, so I finally asked her if she'd ever been here before. She just laughed and assured me that this was all new to her too. I didn't quite believe that though. After a while, she took me to a quiet stretch of beach where a crowd of people had set up a bonfire. There were people of all ages there, roasting marshmallows and playing around. They seemed like a normal, happy bunch. At the edge of the water, there was some kind of wooden platform with a tall wooden mannequin in the exact center. A few kids ran around it, laughing. Rita stepped into the crowd and introduced us. Everyone waved and said hi but I noticed from their expressions that they recognized Rita, even though they pretended like they didn't. We stayed there for a while. I roasted marshmallows while Rita walked around and made small talk with other people. I didn't hear everything she said, but I did notice one word that people seemed to say over and over. Brethren. That really jumped out at me. I mean, who uses the word brethren in normal conversation? I could tell that Rita wanted to stay there for a while, but... I was starting to get a really weird vibe. I thought that maybe this was some kind of pyramid scheme group, like MLM or something. I didn't know exactly what was going on, but I knew for a fact that Rita was keeping something from me. So I politely pulled her aside and said that I needed to get back home. Rita's expression instantly turned cold and she said, You are not leaving. I told her that I really needed to use the bathroom. Even then, she didn't want me to go. But after some arguing, I promised that I'd only be gone a few minutes. Of course, I had no intention of coming back. As I was rushing off, an old man in the group called out to me. Hurry back! You'll miss the festival! This was the first I'd heard about any festival. Before I could answer, Rita chimed in. Yes, we are. As soon as I got back to the house, I opened my laptop and googled the beach to see if there was some kind of weird group in the area. I didn't find anything. Then I searched for brethren and cult. I scrolled through a couple websites until I saw something that absolutely horrified me. It was an article about some kind of cult without an official name. They gathered in a different place every season for their festivals, and wherever they went, people disappeared. The website showed a single blurry picture of the man who was supposedly in charge of the cult. I recognized him as the old man who called out to me before I left. I knew that I needed to get out of there. This was my only chance. I found Rita's purse on the counter and fished around for her keys. I didn't want to steal her car, but I didn't have any other choice. I guess I could have gone to some other beach houses to ask for help, but I didn't know how many people in this little town were part of the cult. I opened the front door, ready to run to Rita's car and make my escape, when I saw three people standing in the driveway, staring at me. I went back inside and locked the door. 
I looked through the other windows around the house, but there were more of those people waiting outside. They had the house surrounded. I guess they knew that I was planning to run away. Frantically, I grabbed my phone and dialed 911. The dispatcher seemed nice at first, but when I told her that a colt was after me, her voice turned cold and she said, Stay right where you are. Don't fight. It will be easier that way. She was one of them too. Losing all hope, I dropped my phone and locked myself in the bedroom. I tried to figure out how to escape, but I couldn't think of anything. Then the bedroom window shattered, and one of the cult members crawled into the room. He grabbed me from behind and shoved the cloth over my face. Instantly, I blacked out. When I came to my senses, I was back on the beach. All the cultists were standing around me. A couple of them held me in place. I was standing on the wooden platform, right in front of their mannequin. But now, the mannequin was on fire. The old man stepped forward. You've been chosen for our next sacrifice, he said, and he glanced toward Rita, who was standing in the crowd. She was looking right at me. That's when I realized that our relationship had been fake all along. She never liked me. She just chose me as the unlucky idiot that she'd throw into the fire. The burning mannequin crackled behind me. I could feel the intense heat on the back of my neck. The old man asked if I had any last words. This was my only chance to figure a way out of this. I thought for a second and then said, I'd like to talk to Rita face to face. The old man nodded and Rita walked up on the platform. I tried to find a trace of regret on her face, but I couldn't. Her expression was completely blank. I had one question for her. Did you ever love me? She didn't say anything. At that moment, I wasn't scared anymore. I was furious. I wriggled free from the men holding me back, rushed forward, and shoved Rita to the side. I didn't mean to push her into the fire, but she lost her balance, and in seconds, she was covered in flames. I ran out of there as fast as I could. I ran for hours until I reached the bus station, where I bought a ticket back home. I never told anyone what happened. I was too scared. Since then, I've gotten several calls from that old man. Every time, he tells me that I'm not in trouble. I prove myself to the cult. I'm a member now. My husband Dave was a businessman. He was a great provider, but I barely saw him. He spent long hours in the office, and about once a month he'd go on business trips all over the country. I loved him more than anything, but after a few years of marriage, he was starting to feel like a stranger. Last summer, he came home one day and said that he'd be gone for a week. He needed to meet with distributors in Missouri. Normally, I wouldn't put up much of a fight, but our anniversary was that week. I didn't want him to be away on our anniversary. I asked him if he could cancel, but he refused. After a bit of arguing, I realized that he'd completely forgotten about our anniversary. I was furious. He said that his secretary Jane was supposed to remind him of important dates, but that wasn't any excuse. He should be able to remember our anniversary without getting help from the office. He hugged me and said he'd make it up to me when he got back. And to show that he meant business, he called his office and told his secretary that she was fired for what she did. He smiled at me as if he'd done something really chivalrous. I was disgusted. I didn't care about his secretary forgetting to remind him. This had nothing to do with her. This was about our marriage and how he didn't take it seriously. So then he called the spa that I really liked and set up an appointment for me on the day of our anniversary. There, he said. Is that better? No, it wasn't, but I was done arguing with him. I pretended to be happy and said, Yes, dear, I love you. The next Monday, he left for his flight to Missouri. He didn't even wake me up to say goodbye. He just left a note on his side of the bed. I spent that whole day alone in the house, trying to figure out what I was going to do. 
I didn't want to leave my husband, but I also didn't want to keep living this way. Dave always chose work over me, and I hated that. I invited a few friends over, and we spent the day in the pool. Then Tuesday rolled around. It was our official anniversary. I called the spa and told them to cancel my appointment. I wasn't in the mood to leave the house. I just wanted to stay at home and sort through my feelings. I cooked a bit, cleaned out some of my old dresses from the closet, and watched a couple TV shows. I also drank. A lot. By the time night rolled around, I was pretty drunk, and I still hadn't figured out what I was going to do about my marriage. I guess I dozed off for a bit on the couch, but I woke up to the sound of footsteps coming from behind me. Someone was inside my house. For a second, I thought that Dave had come back home to surprise me. But when I turned around to look, I gasped. Dave's secretary, Jane, was standing behind me. Her face was twisted in an evil grin, and she had a single kitchen knife in her hand. What are you doing here? I asked. Where is he? she shouted. I uh, assumed she was talking about Dave, so I said, He's on his business trip. You should know this. She cackled, as if I'd said the dumbest thing in the world. <laughs> he doesn't have a business trip. He's probably off visiting Sarah or Monique. I had no idea who Sarah or Monique was. This didn't make any sense. No, I said. He's in Missouri. That jackass would never set foot in Missouri, she said. He's cheating on me again. For years I've done everything he's asked me, and what do I get for it? He throws me away like garbage. He fires me over the phone. You, you've been sleeping with him? I asked. Of course, she screamed. I've ignored the other women, and I've ignored you, the harpy wife. But now I've had enough. And with that, she dove at me. I couldn't believe it. On one hand, I'd always been suspicious of Dave's long nights in the office, but if I told myself that he was a good man, he was loyal. But I guess I was wrong. I stood on the other side of the couch so she couldn't reach me, but she jumped over it and grabbed me by the shirt before I could dive out of the way. She shoved me onto the floor. She was a normal-sized woman, but she was surprisingly strong. Either she spent a lot of time at the gym, or pure rage was making her stronger. She sat on my chest and pressed her forearm into my neck. With one hand, she raised the knife ready to stab me. Wait! I choked out. I could barely breathe, but I needed to say something. I needed to reason with her. What have, what have I done? Why are you mad at me? She laughed again. <laughs> I came here to kill him for what he did, but since he's not here, you'll do just fine, the dutiful, oblivious wife. Look at your house. He's given you the world. It's not fair. Please, I said. Don't you see that we're both victims here? Nice try. Think about it, I said. He's cheating on both of us. Let's, let's team up. I don't know why I said that. The words just came out. But they seemed to work. Jane stopped pressing against my neck. She still clutched the knife like she was ready to stab me, but she pulled back. Get off me, I said, and let's talk. She stood up. I could tell she still didn't trust me, but she was open to listening. She walked over to the couch and sat down. She patted the cushion next to her, inviting me to sit with her. As I joined her, she grabbed my half-finished bottle of wine and started drinking. No funny business, she said. If you try to stop me in any way, I will kill you. Once I sat down, I realized that my cell phone was sitting on the cushion right next to me. Making sure that Jane didn't notice, I reached over and turned down the volume. Then, with one hand, I dialed 911. I asked Jane to explain what she planned to do to my husband. And while my phone was connected to the police dispatch, Jane started talking. She admitted to wanting to kill Dave. She talked about how she snuck into the house and was ready to stab him to death. 
I was very careful with what questions I asked her. I made sure that she admitted to attacking me. I made her list off all the times Dave slept around so that her motivation would be clear. And I even made her say her full name. I kept her talking for a long time, until she finally lost patience. And will you help me? She asked. Will you help me kill him? I wasn't going to kill anyone. And I definitely wouldn't admit to planning a murder with the police listening in on the phone. But I also couldn't tell her no, because she still had the knife. She could still kill me if I said anything wrong. So I said, Tell me exactly what you want from me. I figured that was non-committal enough. She started laying out the plan. She said that we could both wait for him to come home. I could greet him on the second floor, and then she could run out and shove him down the stairs. That way, it would look like an accident. And she finished with, What do you say? Are you in? At that point, I had no idea what to say. But, thankfully, that was the exact moment when the police pushed open the front door and ran inside. Jane tried to put up a fight, but they grabbed her and knocked the knife out of her hand. As they dragged her out of the house, she screamed at me, How could you? You hate him as much as I do! Don't worry, I said. He'll get what's coming to him. Afterwards, a policeman sat me down and got my full statement. I asked him if they'd recorded the full 911 call. He said that they did. I asked if I could get a copy of the recording. He looked at me strangely, but he said yes. The next day, I took the audio file, cut out the parts where Jane listed off all of Dave's affairs, and sent that recording to all his business contacts. I posted it on his Facebook. Then, I went upstairs and packed all Dave's clothes into a suitcase. By the time he came back home, I told him to get out of the house. We've been going through divorce proceedings ever since. It's not over yet, but it looks like I'll get the house and half his money. Like Jane, I wanted to punish my husband for what he did. But I went about it the right way. I had just lost my job and was desperately seeking a replacement when I saw the ad on Craigslist. I had already applied to several positions with little luck, and had turned to Craigslist at the suggestion of a friend who had scored his own gig by responding to an ad on the website. I never used it before, but I figured it was worth a shot and began scrolling through local adverts. Most of them turned out to be duds, but there was one that seemed promising. It was a position as a data entry clerk at a local office, and it matched some of the descriptions from my previous job, so I thought I would give it a shot. I responded to the ad with an expression of interest, and they got back to me almost immediately, asking for my resume and a couple of details. At this point, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The person I was speaking to seemed professional and punctual with their messages, and the ad itself seemed legit. The only thing I didn't do, which in hindsight was foolish, was check out the company itself. I never heard of it before, but I assumed it was one of those big offices that I usually passed by on my way through town. Plus, I was desperate, so I didn't waste too much time on the fine print. After a couple of back and forth messages, they invited me for an interview and sent me an address with a time, 10 a.m. the very next morning. I remarked how fast everything had happened, but even that didn't raise my suspicions. I figured they must have just been as eager to fill the position on their end, and they seemed confident I was the ideal candidate. Nothing was set in stone, of course, until the interview itself. The next morning, I woke up early and got ready for the meeting. I put the address into the GPS app on my phone and tried to figure out which bus to take. The location wasn't where I had expected it to be. Instead, it seemed to be a smaller office complex downtown. Regardless, I didn't want to waste the opportunity. So I left my apartment and hurried to catch the next bus to the other side of town. The bus stopped a short walk away from the office and it was already a bit early, so I decided to check out the area. The location was ideal given it was only a 20 minute ride on public transport from my apartment. Although the area gave me an odd vibe. There wasn't anyone else around and there were no cars except for a gray minivan parked up the street, the windows tinted. Feeling a little uneasy, I decided to head inside. 
The office seemed new, but it was oddly sparse. The reception especially was almost empty, except for a few plastic chairs and a potted plant that looked somewhat crumpled. There was a man sitting behind the desk, tapping his fingers against the keyboard, who glanced up when I entered. He didn't smile at me. Um, hello. I'm here for an interview for the clerk position. He stood up and nodded. Follow me. That's when my unease grew, and a flicker of doubt wormed its way into my chest. He hadn't even asked for any name or identification, and his hospitality was less than ideal. I shrugged it off and followed him through a door leading to a stairwell. As we walked, I couldn't help but wonder why the place felt so empty. I didn't see anyone else, nor did I hear them. No voice, no clacking keys, no coffee machines whirring. Officers weren't usually dead silent. He led me up a flight of stairs to another small reception area. Like the one downstairs, this place was just as empty and sparsely furnished. There was nobody else there. Please, take a seat. Okay, thank you, I said, watching him disappear back the way he had come. I looked around and took a seat. Everything had an almost clinical feel to it. I considered the possibility that the business was a new startup, and that was why the place didn't feel as lived in yet. But it still seemed weird. Where was everyone? I tapped my foot softly against the carpet, my anxieties rising. Maybe I should make an excuse and leave. Something about this place just didn't feel right to me. But it was the only job I'd applied for that had actually gotten back to me. If I didn't give it a chance, I would go back to ground zero, struggling to pay my increasing apartment rent. I really needed a job. Deciding to stick with it, I smoothed the hand over my skirt and took a deep breath. A few minutes later, a door clicked open and a man walked out. He was wearing a suit and slacks, but the edges were crumpled as though he had donned them in a hurry. I stood up and greeted him with a smile. Hello, I'm Erica, I introduced, offering my hand. He took it with a weak shake and led me into the office without a word. The setup was simple, a desk with a computer and some files on the table. I tried not to let my gaze linger, but the computer looked like an old model, and when I glanced at the monitor, it wasn't even turned on. Take a seat, the man instructed, pointing to one of the plastic chairs. I did as he said, shuffling my feet nervously as he closed the door behind us. I swallowed back the lump in my throat. All right, Erica, just a few questions, he said, grabbing a sheet of paper from the desk and running his gaze over it. I tried to quell my anxieties and answer his questions as best as I could, but every nerve in my body was screaming that something was wrong. The questions seemed fairly normal to start with, but then they became odd, not the normal questions you would expect in an interview like this. Do you have any underlying health conditions? I stared at him. Sorry? Do you have any health conditions? Illnesses? Anything like that? He repeated, and I shook my head. Um, no, nothing that would affect my work, I answered. Okay, what about your family life? Do you live alone? I'm not sure how that's appropriate, I stuttered out, a frown creasing my brows. The man flicked his gaze above the paper in his hand, fixing me with a firm look that made my heart beat a little faster out of fear. It's a simple question, really, he said. Do you have a partner, or do you live alone? He was still looking at me, his gaze sharp and expectant. Somehow, I didn't think it was a good idea to tell him I lived alone, so I lied. I, I have a boyfriend, we live together, I said, my voice quivering a little. A shadow fell across his face, but then it was gone before I could figure out why he was there. Before he could ask the next question, I stood up. I, I, I'm sorry, maybe this job isn't right for me after all. I blurted, turning around and reaching for the door. The man was quicker and didn't let me open the door. The interview isn't over, he said in a low voice. I gave a start, my heart thudding in my chest. Wasn't he going to let me leave? I've changed my mind, I said as firmly as I could despite the dread in my chest. Please let me leave before I call the police. For a tense moment, I didn't think he would move. But finally, he stepped back, taking his hand off the door. Without another word, I threw the door open and ran out of there. The man at the downstairs reception watched me leave without saying anything. 
The whole time, I didn't see another person. I pushed through the doors out onto the street, almost tripping over my own feet in my haste to get out of there. The gray minivan was still parked down the road, and I debated taking a picture of its registration, but I didn't want to linger there any longer than I had to. I didn't calm down until I was back at my apartment, and I phoned my friend to let him know what had happened. It was only a few weeks later that I came across a news article talking about human traffickers using fake job advertisements as a way to lure victims. Is that what had almost happened to me? Had I almost been the victim of a human trafficking ring? Given how suspicious the entire interview had been, it would have surprised me. I just hope nobody else is ever in a situation as desperate and foolish as I was to fall for their lies. It was a dim, moonless night, and I was on my way back home from visiting family on the outskirts of the city. It was getting late, just after 11 o'clock when my fuel light came on, warning me I was low on gas. Gritting my teeth, I chugged along for a couple more miles until I spotted a sign for a gas station, half hidden beneath a tangle of vines and weeds. Just before a junction leading onto the highway, I spotted the turning for the gas station and bounced along the gravel slope towards the gas pumps, killing the engine. It was dead at this time of night, and I felt a prickle of unease at the emptiness of the place. I almost got a sense that I wasn't supposed to be here, but I pushed that feeling aside and climbed out, unscrolling fuel tank to fill up. As I was filling up, I threw a casual glance around. There were four gas pumps, but the one next to me was out of order. Everything was covered in a faint layer of rust and grime, and there was a smell of raw sewage in the air from the outdoor toilets around the other side. The sooner I got out of here, the better. The tank was almost three quarters full when headlights flooded the station, and I threw a hand up to shield my eyes from the glare as another car pulled up onto the gravel. It was an old beat up Toyota. I watched as it rumbled and shuddered into the port in front of mine, the lights cutting with the engine. I tried not to stare too openly, watching from the corner of my eye, as a man climbed out. There was something odd about him the moment I glimpsed his wiry beard and damp, sweat-stained clothes, his face shadowed and taut. When he threw a glance my way, I averted my gaze back to the gas pump, trying to ignore the shiver of dread in my stomach. I knew it was bad to make assumptions based on appearance alone, but something about this guy just screamed shady. The man locked the car and headed round the side of the station where the toilets were. When my tank was full, I returned the pump and screwed back on the cap and headed inside to pay. As I passed by the guy's beat up Toyota, I glimpsed something strange. A dent in the truck and a splatter of red against the dark gray paintwork. Rust? No, it wasn't the right color. It was something else. Curious, I stepped closer to have a look then recoiled when something thudded against the inside of the truck. My heart jerked into my throat, and I stared wide-eyed at the truck. What was that? A second later, another thump, and what sounded like a muffled cry. Oh god, was there someone in there? A shadow appeared alongside the building, and I hastily drew away, just as the man came back. I kept my gaze on the ground as I walked past him and into the station, my pulse pounding in my ears. What should I do? If that red stain was blood, and those cries belonged to someone in the truck, should I call the police? Would they even get here in time? I paid as fast as I could and headed back to my car. The guy was already leaving, his turn signal flashing right towards the highway. I started up my engine and drew up behind him, sweat dripping down my neck. Part of me wanted to go the other way and forget I ever saw what I saw, but the other part of me couldn't do that. If someone was in danger, I just couldn't leave them to their fate without doing anything. The car in front turned left at the junction, and so did I. I trailed behind him for a good 20 minutes, keeping some distance between us so that I didn't arouse his suspicions. But given we were the only two cars out here at this time, maybe it was suspicious anyway. As the open road gave way to forestry, I started to doubt my decision to follow him. I had no idea where we were, but we seemed to be getting further and further away from civilization heading out into the middle of nowhere. The road grew twisted, snaking between the trees like a serpent, and at several points, the car in front disappeared around a bend, the midnight fog obscuring him from sight. 
My grip on the steering wheel grew slick as sweat gathered beneath my palms, my chest getting tighter. What was I doing out here? In front of me, the car's taillight disappeared through the trees, and I slowed the car to a crawl and an eventual stop. I should have turned around and left the weird guy alone. If something happened to me out there, how long would it take for someone to discover me? I shouldn't have gotten involved in the first place. I shook my head, raking a hand through my hair, shoving it back from my face. The road was too narrow here. I would keep going until there was somewhere for me to turn around and go home and pretend I'd seen nothing. What could a guy like me do anyway? Checking my rear view, I pulled back out onto the road and kept driving, the trees seeming to close in around me and form a thick canopy overhead. The headlights barely pierced the gloom and I sat forward in my seat, my neck and shoulders tense with dread. Then, something caught my attention in the distance, reflecting the lights from the car. As I slowed the car to a crawl, inching closer, I realized it was an old beat-up Toyota, the same car I had been trailing. It was pulled up at the side of the road, the trunk popped open, the car empty. Where had the man gone? I stopped the car and peered out through the window. When I was certain there was nobody there, I climbed out, shivering in the chilly night air. The keys were still in the engine, but the man was gone. So was whoever had been in the trunk of the car. I walked over to it and peered inside. More blood and a grimy strip of rag. Someone had definitely been gagged and tied up. But where were they now? Had he taken them into the forest? I looked around and my gaze snagged something. Upturned dirt and grass. Drag marks leading between the trees, dotted with specks of blood. Fear wrapped around my chest like a cold hand, and I fumbled to get my phone out of my pocket. I needed to call the police. Someone could be getting murdered out here. My finger shook as I dialed 911, dread sinking low in my stomach, when an automated voice said, no service. Of course there was no service out here in the middle of nowhere. That was probably why the man had driven out here. Nobody around to help. I bit hard on my lip scanning my gaze through the trees. What if the man came back while I was still here? If I could drive somewhere with service, I might be able to call for help and direct them back to this area. No need to put myself in unnecessary danger. I headed back to my car and was about to climb behind the wheel when I heard it. The sound of footfalls echoing beneath the canopy, heavy gasping breaths. I looked up and a figure appeared between the trees, a pale specter against the gloom. At first, I thought it was the man, but the figure was too small, too pale. It was a young woman. Oh my god, I muttered, hurrying towards her. Are you okay? As she drew closer, I noticed the splash of red on the front of her clothes and the hollow look in her eyes. She was sobbing between each pants, her shoulders trembling. Then, I realized she was hiding something. A knife a blade stained with red blood. I took a step back, my eyes going wide. What, what happened? Please, you have to help me, the girl cried. He, he took me into the forest. He was going to kill me. Her hands shook as she held out the knife. I had to, I had to do it. I had no choice. He was going to kill me. She repeated, dropping the knife to the ground. I took a tentative step towards her and nodded. All right, you're safe now, I said. I'll take you to the hospital and we can call the police. The girl nodded and climbed into the front passenger seat, still shaking. With one last glance towards the forest, eerily still in silence, I started up the engine and drove off, leaving the abandoned car behind me in the gloom. My boyfriend Tommy and I had been together for a long time, and I thought things were going well. But one day, I was checking our joint bank accounts online when I noticed that he'd been withdrawing a lot of our money. He took out $150 each month, plus a few one-off payments for several hundred dollars. All of it was going to some OnlyFans accounts. Tommy knew that I wasn't good about checking finances, so I guess he thought I wouldn't notice. I didn't know much about OnlyFans, but I assume he was watching something X-rated. Honestly, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't have anything against it, but 
but he was spending way too much on it. I knew I should have talked to him about it directly, but I was embarrassed. So when he was out of the house, I snuck into his private office and switched on his computer. I already knew his password, so I didn't have any problems connecting to his internet search history. I opened his OnlyFans account and saw that he was subscribed to a woman named Dolly Dearest 47. Her profile picture showed a smiling blonde woman dressed in bright pink. I didn't really know what to do from there, so I clicked on one of her videos. What I saw next absolutely horrified me. The video showed this woman talking directly to the camera. She was presenting a life-sized human doll that she'd made. The doll looked exactly like me. In the video, she mentioned Tommy by name. She called him her most loyal subscriber. Then, still smiling at the camera, she started to torture the mannequin. She cut off some of its fingers. She took a blowtorch to the top of its head. She did many other unspeakable things. And because the mannequin looked identical to me, it was like I was watching someone torture me. I felt like throwing up. Once the mannequin was a melted, mutilated mess, she turned one more time to the camera and said, Okay, Tommy, I hope this helps. I wanted to throw his computer at the wall, but I had to find out more. I clicked on other videos where this woman tortured other mannequins. All of them were realistic and about half of them looked like me. I figured that the rest were based on suggestions from her other loyal subscribers. When I couldn't take any more, I shut down his computer. Since Tommy still wasn't home, I had some time to look around his office. At first, I didn't find anything. Then I opened a cabinet and saw shelves full of weapons. Pliers, knives, flamethrowers. These were all the weapons that Dolly Dearest 47 used in her videos. I was absolutely terrified. I thought Tommy and I were happy together. I had no idea he had such darkness in him. And now he was planning to act on his impulses. He was going to torture and kill me. I had to get out of there. So I raced out of the room, grabbed the backpack of clothes and ran to my car. Unfortunately, Tommy had just gotten back home. He met me in the driveway. He asked what was wrong and I told him that I just needed to run some errands. He didn't believe me. You went on my computer, didn't you? He asked. His expression went blank, and then he started walking toward me. I can explain, he said. I can explain. He tried to grab me, but I pushed him out of the way and jumped into my car. He stood outside the window and screamed at me to come back inside. I drove away as fast as I could. I thought about going to my sister, but I knew that Tommy would find me there. It was too risky. So I drove across town and went to my cousin Candace's house. Tommy had never met her before, so I figured he wouldn't think to come here. Candace saw that I was frantic. I told her the whole story. I got out my phone to call the police, but Candace convinced me not to. She said that Tommy hadn't done anything illegal so far, and if I got the police involved now, he'd just explain everything away. I needed to get more evidence first. She convinced me to contact the OnlyFans girl and find out everything I could. If Tommy has said anything to her about his plans, then I could use that to get him arrested. I wasn't sure if that was a good idea, but I did what she said. I sent Dolly Dearest 47 a private message on OnlyFans. She responded immediately. She explained that her clients used her to play out their revenge fantasies, but they never actually acted on them. I asked her if Tommy seemed different and told her that I'd found weapons in my office. She waited a bit and then replied, That's not good. Maybe Tommy's different. Can we do a video call and talk about it? I sent her a Zoom link and then waited for her to log in. She joined the call, looked on my face for a long, silent moment, and then disconnected. She didn't say a word, and she smiled the whole time. I thought she was trying to help me, but her expression gave me this awful feeling. Why did she want to see my face? My cousin walked into the room and asked what happened. I told her about the call and she gasped. What? I asked. Where were you standing when the video started? I showed her where I was and she pointed toward the family photos on the wall behind me. I think she just wanted to see you so she could figure out where you were. Chills ran down my spine. I asked Candace if we should call the police now, but she said that maybe she was wrong. Maybe this OnlyFans girl just wanted to scare me. 
but Candace wasn't wrong. That night, after Candace had gone to sleep, I was sitting in her living room when I saw a figure walking outside the window. I recognized her right away. It was Dolly Dearest, 47. She walked to the front door and twisted the knob. It was locked, of course. I peered out the window next to the door and saw that the front yard was empty. The woman had left. I started walking towards Candace's bedroom to wake her up when I heard a noise in the kitchen. It sounded like footsteps. Slowly, I walked toward the noise and saw that Dolly Dearest 47 had crawled in through one of the windows. She just stood in the middle of the room, holding a backpack and staring at me. Come here, she whispered. Why are you doing this? I asked. She said, because Tommy is my biggest fan. She reached into her backpack and pulled out a flamethrower. She aimed it right at me, still smiling. Without thinking, I jumped out of the window behind me. The glass slashed into me, but I didn't care. I landed on the grass right as the room burst into flame. The curtains caught fire, and then the walls did too. If I had hesitated for a single second, I would have been burned alive. I ran around the side of the house and pounded on my cousin's bedroom window. She woke up and ran to me. I didn't bother explaining because I knew she could feel the heat coming from the other room. I helped her climb out of the window and we raced to the other side of the street as her house burned to the ground. The police and fire department came pretty soon afterwards. My cousin was too much in shock to say anything, so I explained the whole story. They put out the fire and then went inside to look for Dolly Dearest 47. She wasn't there. Later that night, they sent more officers to question Tommy, but he was gone too. I still didn't know where they were, but I live in constant fear that they'll come back. I worked as a janitor at this mental facility for 15 years, and I still think back to this night. Don't tell my brother this, but I peed my pants a little bit because of those women. At the time, I was working as much as I could. Over the years, I accrued some debt, so whenever my coworkers needed a shift cover, I was there for them. So when I was asked to cover someone's overnight shift on Halloween so they could go to a party, I said yes with no hesitation. The night shift was an easy gig. They really just have you there so they can call you if one of the patients makes a mess. There's no list of expectations you need to hit to make the big man happy. You walk around with your cleaning supplies and sweep up debris if you spot some. Most do this for the first few hours, then hide in a closet and play on their phone for the rest of the shift. I usually bring a book to read. If someone needs you, they call you over a walkie-talkie. I thought it would be easy money and I'm old so I didn't feel like I was missing out on any of the fun festivities. I was happy I gave that young man a chance to have some fun. It was a full moon that night. Before starting my shift, I gazed at it and imagined how much spookier made the holiday for those celebrating. It was an eight hour shift that started at midnight. I clocked in, grabbed my cart and started my rounds. Usually, the short term patients cause more of a fuss than the long term ones. So I started with them to connect with nurses working that night. It's good to touch base so they know who they're calling if something happens. For the first couple of hours, I walked around the short-term wing. There wasn't much, so time passed slowly. I decided to make my way to the long-term wing. To get to the other wing, you have to walk through a hallway entirely made of windows. As I walked down the walkway, the moon glowed in the sky. I spied the closet where I planned to camp out. I stopped by to drop off my book and some food I brought from home. This was the best closet in the facility because we janitors worked together to sneak a recliner into it. Management never stuck their noses in our business as long as we maintained things, so it was a treat we gave ourselves for our hard work. Management surely wasn't going to give us anything. As I was dropping off my stuff, I heard what sounded like chanting through the vents. I didn't think much of it because that wasn't my department unless people started throwing food around. When I stepped back into the hallway, I could no longer hear the chanting. I almost forgot I heard it. I worked my way around the long-term wing, and it was as silent as always. Until I started towards the end of the wing. At the very end of the wing, there is a community room. It has a couple of whiteboards, books, tables, games, puzzles, and other things to help patients pass the time. I walked down the hallway and started to hear the hushed chanting. 
I peered into the rooms of the sleeping patients to see if it was any of them, but they all slept peacefully. The closer I got to the community room, the louder the chanting became. I couldn't make out the words. They weren't English. It sounded like Latin. Patients weren't allowed in the community room after 9 p.m., and I wasn't sure what the protocol was if I found patients out of bed. People only ever called me on the walkie. I had no clue if I called out if someone would answer. The chanting grew louder and louder with each step. Not because I was getting closer, but the chanters were getting louder and faster. I reached the door and looked inside, and three women sat around a star drawn on the ground. I assumed they used ketchup to draw the star because they didn't have access to much else. The women were dressed in pajamas, so I assumed they were patients. I stood outside and I watched. Each sat crisscrossed on the floor with their hands resting on their knees, palms up. Their heads were slightly tipped back and they chanted in perfect unison. It wasn't a short phrase either. It was long, so their ability to stay in harmony was impressive. I didn't get spooked until I saw a dead cat in the middle of their star. I didn't believe my eyes at first, because where could patients in a mental hospital get a cat in the first place? Maybe it was one of their stuffed animals. Lots of patients have stuffed animals, except their cat looked mangy. Looking closer, I realized the star didn't look like a substance smeared on the floor. Blood flowed off the cat and formed the star. I couldn't believe it, but when I looked at the hands of the women, they were clean. The women continued chanting. I thought I needed to call someone and went to grab my walkie, but before I made a move or a noise, one of the ladies snapped her head in my direction. Her eyes met mine and I stumbled back, dropping the walkie-talkie. I bent down to pick it up, and as I rose, one of the other ladies stood before me. I turned to where they were sitting, and the two other women remained. My eyes returned to the woman before me. Turn back, she said. Her breath was rancid. I think you need to return to your room, ma'am, I said, thinking I wasn't ready to subdue a patient. Turn back! She growled louder. I looked into her dilated pupils, and the hair on my arms stood up. The other two women were much closer now. It was so creepy how they didn't make a sound. He saw us. He is something we need to take care of now, one of the others said. No, no, nothing to take care of. You know, it's my time to take a break anyway, so you ladies carry on. Don't mind me. I'll just listen and, as you said, turn back. They each stared at me as I slowly backed away. Once I was a decent distance away, I turned around and ran as fast as my cart would allow. I returned to the janitor's closet and heard their chanting again. I couldn't just sit in there, so I went to the nurse station in the long-term patient wing to tell them about the ladies pretending to be witches. Excuse me, miss. I think I need to tell you some patients are in the community room. Looks like they're doing a ritual of some kind. The nurse looked confused. I just did my rounds. Everyone is in the room. When did this happen? About 30 minutes ago. I mean, everyone is in their rooms. What did they look like? Did you get names? I told her what the three women looked like, and she told me they had no patients matching that description. But I saw them. Let's check the community room together. I just heard them chanting not long ago. We walked down the silent hallway to an empty community room. No star was on the floor. No dead cat. No women chanting. To this day, I know what I saw. I didn't make it up. But I also never took a night shift again, no matter how much money I needed. The gunshot woke us up. It felt like someone snapped their fingers inside my ear canal. While my parents were away for the weekend celebrating their anniversary, I stayed with Kimmy next door. Since Kimmy was a year older, her dad would let us stay up as late as we wanted. Her mom left when she was young, and she didn't like talking about it. We stayed up watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer until about 1am. My parents would never let me watch stuff like that because they thought it was of the devil or something. I didn't understand why it was so evil, but I didn't get to make the rules. The gunshot echoed through the house at 3.34 a.m. Kimmy and I jolted awake and looked at one another. Was that a gunshot? Kimmy asked. 
We crowded around her window to see if something was happening outside, but the view from her bedroom window was of her backyard. It seemed peaceful as the swing swayed in the wind. I suggested we check another window. Kimmy shook her head because she thought her dad would want us to stay put in case something dangerous happened. I told her I was going to look. I started towards her bedroom door and Kimmy followed close behind, begging me to stay put. I'm just going to look out a window that overlooks the street. I'm sure something happened outside. It was so loud, it felt like it came from inside the house. I assured her it was probably fine. After all, her dad locked all the doors and windows before we went to bed. In the darkness, we heard two people quietly bickering. Kimmy's protest became more urgent as she insisted we return to her bedroom. I followed the hushed voices to the stairs that led down to the foyer. I peered around the corner and saw a growing puddle of dark blood at the foot of the stairs. I couldn't see where, or better yet, who the blood was coming from. The bickering increased in volume slightly. You said the house would be empty. I thought it would be. The couple said they were going to the mountains for the weekend and that their daughter would be with one of their neighbors. Well, clearly you are wrong, because who is this man? I stepped down one stair to see if I could see more of the banister. Kimmy tried to pull me back, but I shook her off. Through the beams, I saw Kimmy's dad stiff on the floor with his eyes open, not blinking. His chest was covered in blood, dripping off him towards the front door. The bickering pair were both dressed in black, each holding large bags. This is your fault. You were supposed to pick an empty house, so you clean up your mess. You didn't have to kill him. We could have just knocked him out. This is what we get for letting you carry a gun. I'll go look for valuables. I backed up the stairs to Kimmy, who kept asking what I saw. I couldn't bring myself to answer, but I knew she couldn't see what had happened. You were right. We should stay in your bedroom. Or better yet, do you have a guest room? We need to hide. Why? What's happening? What didn't you see? I'll tell you later, but we really need to hide right now. There are people here and I think they're going to rob you. We don't have any phones to call the police, so we need to hide until they leave. I don't think getting in their way is a good idea. Kimmy stopped asking questions and led me to the guest room. The bed was a queen, so we could both fit under it, whereas Kimmy's was a twin. We thought it would be best if we stayed together. We crawled under the bed. Fortunately, the room looked like Kimmy's grandma decorated it, so the bed had a white lace bed skirt that concealed us. We positioned ourselves to face the door. Moonlight streamed in from the windows onto the floors. If the door would open, it would cast a shadow we would have seen. Neither of us dared to move or speak. Kimmy kept holding her breath to be as quiet as she could, but then would gasp for air. I looked at her, put my fingers to my lips, then pointed at my nose. Just breathe through your nose slowly. They won't be able to hear. She nodded, and tears began to gather in her brown eyes. I wanted to tell her that we would be okay and get through this, but I didn't want to risk saying something and being overheard. We heard one of them opening drawers and doors, rustling through everything. Every now and again, the ransacking would be interrupted by an abrupt thud of something heavy. I knew it was Kimmy's father, but I couldn't tell her yet. She would become hysterical, and we needed to stay hidden until we could find a phone to call for help. The door to the guest room swung open, casting a shadow in the moonlight. We saw heavy black boots through the white bed skirt. Kimmy covered her mouth with her hand. I froze to the point that it was hard to breathe. The robber began to open all the drawers. He went into the closet and checked every piece of clothing and every pocket as if Kimmy's dad was hiding a diamond necklace in his winter jackets. The man dropped down to his stomach and lifted the skirt. I slapped my hand over my mouth to contain my gasp. Kimmy jumped, hitting her head on the bottom of the bed. I grabbed her hand and the robber looked at us. He looked at us for a moment, debating what to do. Then he lifted his index finger over his lips and nodded at us. He slowly put down the bed skirt, got up and left the room. The robber continued to rummage through Kimmy's home. We weren't sure when they left. We were too scared to come out from under the bed until the morning sun replaced the soft moonlight. We came out and I explained to Kimmy what I saw. She ran downstairs looking for her dad but couldn't find him. I looked around for a phone to call 911 and my parents, but they must have taken Kimmy's dad's phone or destroyed it. I decided to go to the neighbors across the street to ask to use their phone. The cops came and opened an investigation. 
They were able to catch the robbers because they tracked Kimmy's dad's phone. The one who confused houses forgot to turn it off while dealing with the body. Both men were arrested. Kimmy ended up moving in with her grandparents. I still see her occasionally, but not as often as when she was next door. It's hard to shake the guilt from that night because the robbers meant to hit my house. If they hadn't messed up, Kimmy would still have her dad. It was one of those days when time traveled slowly, crawling with such a fullness that made the hands itch for some excitement. I had eaten and drank from dawn until late in the afternoon, and I had seen the recent psychological thriller that had just come out on Netflix. My house was neatly clean, and an incense had been lit to keep it smelling wonderful when I found myself in front of my computer, scrolling through items on Craigslist that I wanted to get. Some of the vendors had good stuff, but none caught my eyes like the one from a vendor Julie Salazar, who had a fine bike that she wanted to sell at a steep price. I confessed that I was more fascinated by the audacity of the price than anything else. It was not a neat looking bike, and it looked rather ordinary, but it was expensive. I assumed it was a joke, and decided to get in on it by texting the number attached to the ad. My fingers typed away without a thought on my screen, without thinking clearly, and it was not until I was done before I read what I had written. It made sense. A jest for a jest. How quickly can you get this bike to me if I paid the sum? I had written and turned my attention back to the Craigslist platform for a good couple minutes, not more than 10 before my phone chimed with the notification of an incoming message. Her response was polite. She said if it was around her area, she could get it to me before dusk as she badly needed the cash. As soon as I get the cash, I can transport the bike to you. Her message read, I knew I didn't want the bike, but the temptation lingered. I asked her for the specification of the bike. She mentioned she would have to look somewhere for it, as it had been a while since she had bought it. I told her I'd wait. She went offline and reappeared with a message that relayed everything she knew about the bike and read from the manual. She added that she had bought it for her teenage son and he didn't need it anymore. I asked why. She said he died in a car accident and the money was for funeral costs. I flushed with guilt. She sounded sincere even though I could not have imagined sensing emotions from text. My fingers hovered over the screen for a moment as I processed whether to cut the joke off or to simply carry on. From better sense, I decided it was unwise to continue the joke as I had had no idea despite how ridiculous the price was. I mentioned it to her. Then I dropped my phone. Moments later, my phone chimed again. Is this some sort of sick joke? My heart skipped and I scowled, staring straight at my screen in amusement as to what this might mean. I held my breath and sent a reply, telling her I had found a better alternative to her bike on the basis of price. Her response was almost instant. Do you have any idea what you have done? You have wasted my time. I can't get that back. Now I have to get back at you for taking me for a fool. I will hack you from limb to limb, pig. Blood stopped in my veins as I struggled to process the purports of the message. I broke out sweating. It was a threat, texted over phone, but the intensity of her emotions seemed to break the barrier that made tension palpable. Trickling globules around my face wound around my beard and down my neck. In a way, I acknowledged the threat, but I was unfazed by the thought of a stranger sending a warning at me. I blocked the number and continued on Craigslist with no mind of it. An hour later, I made a mistake when I answered the door. The noise from outside of my house drew my attention, a car speeding up and down the street until it finally stopped across my house. The Toyota was unassuming, resembling a soap. The rider's maneuvering steer on the vehicle lent a punishing screech on the tar in front of my building when she halted. Black hair, black denim pants, and a pair of boots on her feet. I saw the rider walk up to the front of my door with a hand behind her. I assumed she was mistaken, but she knocked on my door. I had no thoughts about the Craigslist incident when I saw this rider. I was rather pissed at someone coming to my door at such a time of day. Who are you? I asked, opening the door slightly to gaze upon this stranger at my door. Are you Jesse? She asked with a smirk on her face. I nodded my head. She whipped her hand from her back revealing she had carried a hatchet which I ducked from nimbly. 
The blade sunk into my door with a hissing noise, and she plucked away at the edge. I watched in horror as this stranger bulked her frame up and rushed towards me with intent, even though I had no idea who she was. My ears pounded with the noise of my heart beating in my chest. Who the hell are you? I asked, tumbling away in fright and confusion at her overwhelming ferociousness coming straight at me. You go around Craigslist, fooling people and wasting their time? She asked. People like you drive me over the edge all day, bitch, and I will make sure there is less of you anywhere. Alone, face to face with the crazed woman wielding a hatchet, it felt as though I was staring death in the face on the day I least expected it. The horrible feeling of my stomach collapsing on itself and my mind racing quickly to find a solution to the chaos I had suddenly found myself in left me numb. I was damp with sweat and a cold feeling seized the tip of my fingers. I had never felt such symptoms for my anxiety and the thought paralyzed me. I knew I had to put something between us both and I could only think of my room. I turned around and raced for the stairs with her breath coming down my neck. In a case of sudden luck that I'd not expected, I sensed my feet slip on the stairs from my sweaty body dripping on the platform. I planted a firmer grip on the stairs. She did not, and it was too late before she realized. She slipped face first and landed with her nose slamming on the edge of the stairs. Her body suddenly went limp, rolling down the stairs to the floor. I thought about returning to the floor to help her, but it made no sense. So I went for my phone and called the cops instead. The cops came for her in a matter of minutes, resuscitated her, and took her into custody. I made sure to never forget the name or the face if we should ever cross paths again. Julie Salazar A few weeks ago, I went to visit my grandparents in Nebraska. It had been a couple years since I'd seen them, and I was really excited to go even though I always got a weird feeling when I visited their town. It was so small and isolated, the kind of place where everyone knew each other. I got a late start. By about 10 at night, I was still on the road. It was a pretty empty stretch of highway and I hadn't seen cars for a while. I noticed that my gas was pretty low, so as soon as I saw a gas station, I pulled in to fill up my tank. The place seemed very run down. There were cornfields behind the station, no other cars were there. I pulled up to the only pump they had and tried to use my card, but the card reader wasn't working. I'd have to go inside. I walked into the gas station, but no one was inside. Hello? I called out. Then a young guy walked out of the bathroom. He seemed surprised to see me. I guess they didn't get a lot of customers at this time of night. The first thing I noticed about him was his really pale blue eyes. They were so light. He almost looked blind, and he didn't seem to blink at all. He just stared at me as he walked closer. I told him that I needed to buy some gas. He smiled and walked behind the counter. As he got closer, I noticed that he had red stains all down his shirt. He was wearing an old white shirt, not a uniform, and it looked like it was stained with blood. He must have noticed me staring at his shirt because he laughed and said it was just paint. I thought that was a very strange thing to say. For one, it didn't look like paint. And for another, it didn't make sense for someone to use bright red paint in a gas station bathroom. Something wasn't right. I forced a smile and gave him a 20. He took my money, but then he didn't do anything. I waited for him to type in the amount so I could get my gas and leave, but it seemed like he didn't know how the machine worked. Then he started pushing some buttons, but I could tell that he was pretending to know what he was doing. I felt myself slowly back away from him. I knew I had to get out of there. Is something wrong? He asked me. No, I said. Nothing's wrong, thank you. I started to hurry out of the gas station, but he shouted at me to stop. I froze right in front of the door. Is there a problem? I asked. You tell me, he said. Then he typed in something else in his machine, and I heard a beep. Your payment went through he said. I sighed. Maybe I was scared over nothing. Maybe he was just a worker with paint on his shirt. Without looking at him, I thanked him and ran out. I rushed to my car. I thought about just jumping in and driving away, but my gas was very low. I'd already paid, and the strange man was still inside. 
so I lifted the nozzle and started pumping my own gas. As I was filling up, I kept staring at the station, making sure that the man wasn't coming out. My cell rang in my pocket, which made me jump. I pulled out my phone and saw that my grandma was calling. I answered it. Hearing her familiar voice instantly calmed me down. She asked where I was and I told her the name of the gas station. Oh, she said, Rudy's place. I know the owner. Tell him hi for me. Can you tell me what Rudy looks like? I asked. Grandma said that Rudy was a 50-something man with a beard. Definitely not the guy I'd seen. Someone else working here tonight, I told her. Are you sure? She asked. Rudy's always there. Unless he's taking time off to be with his son. Before I could ask her anything else, Grandma explained that Rudy's son had just gotten released from prison. She mentioned the son's piercing blue eyes. That's when I knew that she was describing the man I just met. What was he in prison for? Manslaughter, Grandma said. He was always a violent kid. Poor Rudy had his hands full. I felt a shiver run down my back. I told my grandma that I'd see her soon, and then ended the call. I put the nozzle back in place and jumped into my car. I tried to close the door, but I couldn't. The man had come out of the station and grabbed my door. I hadn't seen him approach. Who were you talking to? He asked. No one, I said. Were you calling the police? He asked. No, I whispered. My hands were shaking. I tried to stick my key in the ignition, but he grabbed the key out of my hand. You shouldn't have called the police, he said. He pointed at the red stains on his shirt. I told you this was just paint. I know, I said. Please let me go. He threw my keys over his shoulder. You're not going anywhere. He grabbed me by the shirt and pulled me out of the car. I begged for him to stop. I don't remember exactly what I said, but it must have been something about how I didn't see anything and I just wanted to leave. He threw me to the ground and then lowered his foot onto my back, pinning me against the dirty asphalt. What do you want? I don't know anymore, he mumbled. I tried to scream for help, but I knew that no one would hear me. He pressed his foot so hard against my back that I could barely breathe. Don't move, he ordered. I couldn't raise my head off the ground, so I couldn't see him, but I could hear a click. I knew he just opened up a pocket knife. Don't, I whimpered. Please. He didn't say anything for a long time. Everything was deathly quiet. Then out of nowhere, I heard police sirens blaring from the road. Instantly, the man raised his foot from my back. I looked up just in time to see him run into the cornfield. In seconds, two police cars pulled up next to me. The cops ran out and asked me what happened. I told them that Rudy's son had attacked me. A few of them ran into the cornfields to find him, while another one sat by me to make sure I was okay. How did you know I was in trouble? I asked. The cop explained that my grandma had called them as soon as I got off the phone with her. She knew something was wrong. The cop found my keys on the ground and told me to go home. I drove straight to my grandparents' house, crying the whole way. The next day, that same cop came to our house and said that they'd found Rudy's body in the bathroom. He'd been stabbed. Unfortunately, his son was never found.